You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyder's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 97, our 12th question and answer show. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the cult leader, Dr. Michael Heiser. <laughs> hey, Mike, how yeah, are you? Th- thanks for that, Trey. Yeah, I, sh- I, should, I shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> for those Please. of you who are wondering, I, I was called a cult leader this week, so uh, congratulations. They're in order, I guess. But Yeah, well, give us the details here. Uh, just somebody that says my material is uh, is cultish, nice. you know, and so, hey, thanks for that. Be warmed and filled. Yeah. And I, I, what I wanted to say was, boy, I, you know, I, I must be a really inept cult leader because I don't have any money and like I don't have a harem, you know. And well, was that? I don't, I don't have weapons, you know. It just <laughs> was that from a, a fellow Christian or? You yeah, know? yeah, okay. yeah. Not, I mean, nobody I know. Just someone just had to give me the good news in email, something that they oh. heard uh, oh, okay. in, in their church. Yeah, oh, that was really nice. in, in the church. Oh, okay, it's getting better. Yeah. All right. Well, Mike, uh, notice we got some more reviews and ratings. So that, that helps us a lot. Those ratings and reviews help others find us and, or decide to listen to us. So we appreciate those who champion this podcast and, and help those discover this great content. And, and I want them to listen to the podcast so they can hear questions like this, because <laughs> this next, we've got about a dozen oh or so questions again. And this first Hardly question wait. Well, the first question up is Jason from Costa Mesa, California. He wants to know, is there sex in heaven? <laughs> That's not funny, does he, Mike. Does he, does he give a reason for that? Or? He gives a bunch of reasons, but you, we're going to leave it there so you can have more time to talk about sex in heaven. Yeah, well, this this probably is related to the uh, the whole, you know, Matt, the, the thing in the Gospels about the Sadducees. The, the whole marriage question, you know, whose whose husband will this, you know, this this uh, you know woman be, and so on and so forth. So the, the marrying and giving in marriage and having and all that kind of that's that's what I would suspect anyway. Uh, you know, I when I when I've answered this question in the past, you know, I, I I haven't I haven't categorically said things like there's no sex in heaven. I I actually, you know, my my, my real estimation of this is that. We don't have any commentary on this in Scripture, which tells us that, biblically speaking, this is not either an important question or it would be sort of cast as a silly question or, again, just assigning no relevance to it. But, you know, what, what I'm really trying to say when I, when I deal with this question either in the book An Unseen Realm or in other places is that heaven uh, isn't a realm where there's embodiment that requires procreation. Uh, and that's typically, again, I think the you know, the major concern here, but obviously the, the, the questioner and other questioners I've gotten, you know, sort of make it more, I guess, pleasure oriented or recreational oriented. But typically when, when scholars address this or even some ancient texts, you know, that that's kind of the point. We don't have, we don't have the need to, to produce the next generation in heaven because it's not an embodied terrestrial existence. You know, we don't need to do X, Y, or Z like we do to maintain our life here because that's the place of eternal life. So it, it sort of just gets kind of taken off the table because the the, the things that require us to do uh, to maintain ourself and and our our lives are just no longer in play. You know, when when you get to heaven now, but we know you know from previous episodes, obviously there's some sort of embodiment. You know, either you know, I think it goes beyond the visual. Oh, we look like we have bodies in heaven. I think there is again real embodiment. We've, we've spent, you know, some time going through first Corinthians 15 about that, but whatever the embodiment is, it's different. Again, it's, it's, it's qualitatively different, but you never actually get the, a discussion, you know, or when I say a discussion, I mean, any sort of exegetical thing that you can kind of, uh, you know, hang a discussion on. You don't get any, any part of scripture that really says, well, you know, this embodiment, you know, this, this glorified embodiment that, that, that somehow allows for or enhances, you know, sexual activity. You, you don't get anything like that. It's just like it's not even a consideration. Uh, it's not something that's even on, on the table. So that's kind of where I would leave it. I don't, like to, I don't like to speculate on stuff like that. I don't have anything to hang, 
you know, a position on other than to say, there's just nothing, there's nothing going on about this. There is embodiment. When you have a divine being become embodied and come to earth, well, now they're in the, on the terrestrial plane. Okay, the, 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 the context is different. You're in the terrestrial world. You're not in the, in the heavenly world. In the terrestrial world, you, you, you have not only the capacity to do these things, but you also have the activity going on because there's necessity to it. Um, you know, you, you come to earth, you're a divine being, you can eat meals. Well, you don't have to eat in heaven. You don't have to sustain your life, but you can do it. Because why? Well, you're on the terrestrial world. The, the divine being is now on the earthly plane. You don't see it in reverse, where in the heavenly plane, we do the same things we do in the earthly plane. There's, there's just nothing like that. So, it, you know, you, you, you get this, you, you get a treatment of capacities, bodily capacities, when divine beings come to earth, but you don't get the opposite in scripture. So I think that's kind of where we have to leave it, uh, which isn't a denial, but it's also not an affirmation. It's a, who knows? And Jason does bring up a point about the sons of God. You know, did they have a libido since they found the beauty of human women and came down and, you know, married. So there had yeah, to be I, some I, form of desire there to start. Yeah. That. And, and, you know, books like Enoch actually, actually make that kind of transparently clear. You know, there's this lust element. Uh, you know, scripture doesn't, but books like Enoch uh, certainly uh, do, you know, other sources like that. And I, again, I kind of file this, uh, you know, in the category of, hey, you know, since we're, we're talking about the divine realm, and, you know, I can't really coherently say the divine realm can't do X, Y, or Z. And so if it can do X, Y, or Z, like become embodied, then I also don't have any reason to conclude that the embodiment that is chosen, you know, has you know, lacks certain capacities that normal human embodiment would. Again, you know, and I, I take it as some sort of embodiment that operates on the in the terrestrial sphere along with with humans, where these capacities are are part and parcel of of that that particular embodiment situation. Now, you know, when it when it comes to the the Genesis six thing, this is one of the reasons why, you know, some people prefer the still prefer a supernaturalist view, but they'll pre they prefer what would be called the mythic view, and that is the sexual language in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, is euphemistic. You know, to, it, it, it's, it's used to convey the idea that, that sons of God, other divine beings, you know, rival divine beings, uh, rebellious divine beings, raise up their own human populations to oppose the people of Yahweh. So again, it, it's still a supernatural view, but it takes the sexual language euphemistically, and and some people prefer that because it it kind of circumvents or avoids you know questions like this. Uh, again, I'm I'm just open to to both possibilities. The reason I, you know, I put both of them in unseen realm is because I think people should know about both of them. Uh, the the only thing that I I sort of reject is that you know we we can't look at Genesis six one through four and any of these other you know, angelic embodiment, you know, kinds of things where you have Elohim beings, divine beings become embodied and do certain things. I, I, I think it's illegitimate to strip the the supernatural character out of that just for the sake of being able to sort of put it on the shelf and dismiss the passage now, which is something like what the Sethite view does. It it makes it makes the discussion go away kind of thing in, in, in its totality. So that, that I object to, and, and nobody in antiquity looked at, looked at it that way uh, in either testament. And so that's a little bit different than, than this. So I, I just think we need, you know, if we're going to take the supernaturalistic worldview of the biblical writers seriously, we should do that. But in this case, for some of these things, there, there is more than one uh, way to look at some of this, especially the the sexual language. And just a couple more points that Jason brings up is, you know, does it the form of one's body reflect its function? Paul metaphorically asserted that no part of the body is useless, but each part is indispensable. And then also, you know, the motive of the... Of course, the body. context for that, you know, he's using the analogy of, of an earthly body with an in an earthly context you know right. analogy of the human body right and he goes I mean, if, if, like if we don't if we don't have blood you know in a resurrection body if we have bodies like jesus did right you know where he's not leaking blood out of his hands well does that violate what paul says i guess blood's no more use anymore i mean no, of course not that's you know one's not a commentary on the other yeah and then his last point is related to the motive of the sons of god for mating with human women could it be that they felt unsatisfied uh with non uh, procreative sex in heaven and wanted to establish a name for themselves? And if so, doesn't this mean that sex in heaven, if it exists, 
results in no creation of life and thus no name to establish a competing family line. In other words, is is it just for for pleasure or mm-hmm. just you know that that kind of thing? Mm-hmm. Well, again, who am I to say yes or no? I don't know because we don't have any we don't have any material about it. I mean, there there is again in some of the Enochian literature, you get this sense that once you know the Watchers come to Earth and they and they get human embodiment, then they they experience again these human impulses and urges and they they want to act on them. So there's there's a there's a little bit of an element of that. Um, again, because they have you know this terrestrial embodiment, but does that work in the other direction? You know, we're again we we just we're working with no data here, and so you know again I I'm perfectly comfortable when I don't have something to hang a, a view on, just saying hey I don't know I don't know. Okay, our next question is from Hiram in Puerto Rico. What difference can you point out between glorified believers and the angel of the Lord from the Old Testament? I got a little confused on that from the last chapter of the Unseen Realm and the <clears throat> Revelation 3.12 interpretation, given when it was pointing out to glorified believers bearing the name. I thought that was the key point for this angel to be Yahweh embodied. Well, what I would say in relation to Revelation 3.12, let me just read it. It says, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write my name on him I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. I think, you know, we we have to draw attention to the fact that this doesn't say that God puts his name in, okay, the the person, in the believer. So that that right away is sort of a difference between the wording here in Exodus 23, where my name is in this particular angel. So we, we don't have that language here that God puts his name in you know, this believer. I mean, in in the New Testament era, of course, the spirit, you know, resides in the believer. But I think the language here just generally is pointing to, again, making, I mean, look, we have a, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. So, you you know, you've already got this, this sense earlier in New Testament books that the church, Christians, individually and corporately, are the temple of God. So I, I, I tend to think this language just kind of echoes that. And what's in you know the believer. The reason we're we're the temple is that you know we have the we have the presence of God uh, dwelling in us in, in the spirit. You know, and you say, well, that that does sound you know kind of like you know what's going on in in uh, Exodus twenty three, except for you. Ha- it's the only circumstance where you see that, and it refers to again this this being that is not human, this being that is non human and is is again coming in an embodied form. And God telling you know Moses, hey, this this person here, this angel, this messenger, this this being I'm sending on the way to lead you to the land, is me. Again, we don't we don't have in the Old Testament this sense of the Spirit taking up residence in each believer. You know, in the Old Testament, it's much more unusual, much more localized. So I would say that plus again the the, the slight difference in language here, uh, I think distinguishes the two ideas. Our next one's from X Avion 251, not 252, but 251. Okay. See, now that sounds like a like a cult member thing right there, you yeah. know, giving people names. Well, know, these are your peeps. Or so. numbers, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe so. it's work. You know, I... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so X Avion 251 was wondering what Mike's thoughts are on the geographical location of the Garden of Eden. What do you think of the idea of it being underneath the present day Persian Gulf? Well, not, I mean, none of the proposed orientations or the proposed locations for the Garden of Eden, there, there have actually been a, a good number of them. None of them are really completely satisfactory. I mean, of course, there is a sort of a plausibility scale. Some of them are just, you know, totally wacky, and, and others, you know, have sort of gotten academic attention because of the geographical indicators in Genesis 2. Uh, from what I've read, I, I think this is probably, again, some location near at or you know presently covered by water underneath the, the Persian Gulf. I think it's fair to say, and I, I'm not alone here, but I think it's fair to say this is the one with the least problems. And so as of today, it, it, it's probably the view that that is is kind of the most workable, or at least has the most potential uh, to be the answer to this question. But beyond that, I don't think we can say anything with uh, with certitude. Okay. 
Next one's from Jonathan in the UK. What are your thoughts on the identity of Allah of the Muslims? A distorted view of Yahweh? A rebel Elohim who passed on revelation to Muhammad? Or something else? I think, you know, that that, that Allah in the, the Quran is more or less a distorted view of Yahweh. Um, because the, so much of the Quran draws on the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament for that matter. And then, uh, you know, recasts. The, the the single god you know that that muslims you know worship and follow so i think that probably you know has the you know has the most explanatory power at least in terms of the content of the quran i mean if if you're talking about again the you know the radicalized thinking and again certain hyper literalistic interpretations of of jihad you know in the quran you know i i i certainly think it's within the realm of, of possibility that that is you know demonically motivated and engineered but that's a bit of a different question than than saying hey when we read about Allah in the Quran is that just a really distorted picture of of the single god knowing again that in in their geographical context plus you know, folks I, I don't know if you've read you know realize this but you ought to read the Quran and it and if you read the Quran one thing's going to become very clear there's a lot of material in the Quran that comes out of the Old Testament and the New Testament so that tells you they have the same sort of, you know, monotheistic orientation point. And so that is what leads me to say that that they have just taken the the true God, the God of, of the universe, so to speak, the creator God, and, and recast him and uh, re refashioned you know, his his character to be something more favorable to again the the religious predilections of whoever produced the Quran. So I, I, again, I, I don't think we need to, to see anything more mystical in it than that. But as far as the, the behavior that's attached to it and the, you know, the way certain things get articulated within, you know, Islam by, by some who, you know, want to use it as a tool for jihad. I think there's certainly some, some demonic, you know, stuff going beyond that. I think that's a distinct possibility. And for our listeners, that snort was not Mike. That was his pug. That was my snorting. productivity pug. Yes. That was Maury, the, the productivity pug. How, Make, he was, I disturbed him. Yes, I disturbed him. He was on my lap doing his job. Yes. Giving me energy, sapping energy from the pug <laughs> to do the podcast. <laughs> well, I'm glad he's uh, enjoying this episode. So tell yeah, him to relax. Now. All right. All right. All right. All right, Mike. Well, the next question is from Matthew, and then the one after that is from Lindsay. They're kind of asking the same question, so I'm going to read the one from Matthew first and then follow it up with Lindsay's question. And Matthew's question is, he would love to hear Mike's take on what the seraph are, particularly in relation to the bronze snake incident in Numbers. And Lindsay wants to know, should we imagine there being any kind of physical resemblance between real divine beings and the representative images have found throughout history? That is, do seraphim really look like snakes with wings? Well, I mean, you, do they really look like snakes with wings? But this, this takes us into all sorts of things. There's, boy, this is one of those cases where I wish, you know, there were certain journal articles that were sort of publicly available. And I'm trying to, I'm racking my brain here. This one might actually be uh, publicly available because it's from Biblica. Uh, so if you want to Google Biblica, B-I-B-L-I-C-A, and then journal and put in the last name P-R-O-V-E-N-C-A-L. Okay. I think his first name is Philip, but I'm, I'm, I could be mistaken there. There's an article on the the term seraph, the, the seraph terminology, and I think this is really a good article because it goes into the the zoology behind the terminology, and there's a lot of good material in this in this journal article about how the term, the biblical term seraph, which is often kind of assumed to to be the verb, you know, to burn. Uh, sort of that that typical view kind of overlooks the fact that we also have a noun here and we have an Egyptian term SRF okay for for lack of you know being able to illustrate hieroglyphs here but we have a uh, an Egyptian term of the same consonants that means snake okay and specifically you know this idea of a winged serpent isn't actually a, a serpent with like wings like a bird 
it comes from cobra imagery where you know as a, when you're looking at a cobra it it can it, it the skin on the on the sides of it can become sort of flanges you know that that protrude from its body on either side that is where the the ancient you know semitic idea of the winged you know serpent comes from because it looks like it's it's got appendages and this this terminology again from egypt really kind of covers both the burn and the, and the serpent, because you know you have certain parts of the Middle East that where you had spitting cobras, and if you were hit by the venom, it would burn, or if you're bitten, it would burn. You know, so the fiery serpents—they're not like serpents that are flames, you know, kind of, you know, flitting around in the sand. It, it's 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 metaphorical language for the the pain that it inflicts, and you have the same situation going on on here. So you have. You have seraph to burn. You have seraph, you know, serpent, and they they're kind of like two sides of the same coin. So as far as the terminology, I think that is you know the the, the right way to understand the term itself. It's not just burn. It, it it also again is serpent. And so when you go to the biblical seraphim, you know the question is: Is this actually what a seraphim looks like? Well, you know, on one level, yeah. If you're if you're Isaiah, you're in the in the throne room and you encounter you know. If you're in the throne room of God, you encounter a, a seraphim, you know, sh- well, shouldn't, shouldn't this be the way they look like? Well, the problem with that is you have, you know, a, a seraph, an SRF in, in Egypt. This particular term is also used of a divine throne guardian. You say, well, why is that a problem? Well, because the Bible not only uses that term for a divine throne guardian, but it also uses cherub, karuv, Akkadian, uh, which again, in, in Mesopotamian, you know, thinking is also a throne guardian. So you can't really have a throne guardian that looks like a, a serpent and then, you know, well, like, did it change its appearance when it looks like a, you know, a cherub, a winged, you know, kind of bovine character or something like that, you know, or a winged, you know, leonine character, depending on the, the Mesopotamian iconography. I, I don't, I don't think we can, we can look at this material and say, Hey, you know, if, if like, well, I'm walking down the road someday and I'm encountered by a seraphim. This is what they're going to look like. I don't think that's the point. I think these terms are used of divine beings whose specific role is thought to be guarding the throne of the Almighty. You say, well, why the two different orientations? Why the two different terms? Why the two different you know, iconographical appearances? Well, you would use – you're going to see cherub and this – I'm going to I'm going to leave the statement at what I'm going to say here and we'll see if anybody picks on why picks up on why this would be controversial. But you're going to see karuv, the Mesopotamian term used in texts that were composed in a Mesopotamian context. Because that is going to communicate with the immediate audience of the day. When the biblical writer uses karuv, karuvim, people are going to know instantly what that is and what its role is because they've seen that in the throne iconography of the particular location that they're in. If you use the SRF, serif, okay, in, in, in Egyptian, if you use that, well, that's an, a good indication that that text was composed in some historical context where the Egyptian iconography, the Egyptian trappings of royalty would have been seen and understood and evident. And so that is why the biblical writer uses an Egyptian term in one text and a Mesopotamian term in another. It has to do with the context in which the original readers would have been familiar at the time of the writing of the text. I'm going to leave it there. And again, we'll see if if listeners pick up on why that might be a controversial statement. And if if it is, you can send that to Trey, and we can we can comment it on, on it in the next uh, Q and A. But I don't think any of these descriptions, you know, can really be, you know, used to, to sort of, uh, you know, zoologically classify divine beings because divine beings by nature are not actually embodied. Now you say, well, if if they came here to Earth, you know, like could they? You know, if a throne guardian came here to Earth and they wanted a human to know it was a throne guardian, could they pick that appearance so someone familiar with their Bible would know that, hey, that's a throne guardian over there? Well, I suppose so. You know, I, I suppose that that could happen. Um, but what you typically see is is these are heavenly visions where, where prophets or whoever are, again, transported into the divine realm. And again, that, that's how the, the role of this particular divine being is is telegraphed to the one who views it. 
but by nature they're not embodied they don't have you know the you know the they, they don't have you know forms of of beings that would or excuse me that creatures that would correspond to sort of the you know terrestrial life but when we're writing about those things that's that helps to communicate what they do you know in in the spiritual world so that's why this this kind of this kind of language is used so i don't know if that really helps but again that that's that's my perspective on it all right lindsay second question is if after jesus's return we are to take the place of the rebellious divine council members and rule the nations revelation 2 26 mm-hmm. to 27 of what whom do the nations consist does mike agree with the premillennialism idea that resurrected glorified saints will rule over a still fallen world that includes unglorified unbelievers? If not, who is around to make up the nations? Well, I, I view the the final consummation of of the the kingdom to be the new Eden, and that's that's really about all I can say. You know, I, I don't. I know that doesn't conform to either. You know, of of necessarily of the options that the the questioner, you know, put into the question. Um, so I. I in that respect, I don't follow either traditional premillennial thinking or traditional amillennial thinking. I think that there will be a – the final form of the kingdom is going to be on earth, and I view it as the, 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 the new earth. So who's, who's occupying the nations? You know, the answer would be you know, people, glorified people or whatnot. I don't think you have to have bad guys to be able to rule over the nations. To, to be able to displace and replace the rebellious sons of God and reconstitute the divine council. I don't know why you need fallen people to do that. Uh, you know, because the, the whole idea of, of ruling over the nations is, is you maintain, you go back to Eden, you maintain, you administer, and you, of course, enjoy the, the world, the, you know, the, the creation that God has made. You enjoy it for what it is. You maintain it. You care for it. You, you do whatever God wants you to do for it and with it. You know, you're using the original Edenic setting, the original Edenic commands as a model. Uh, and again, we're not told a whole lot, you know, about how this is going to work. But I don't see the necessity of having you know fallen people in a in a future millennium. I, I don't. I actually don't even like the term millennium, even though I believe in a, in a coming earthly kingdom, because to me, millennium is too short. And if, if I'm identifying it with the the the, the new Earth again, the, the globalized Eden, then it's too short. We're not going to limit it to a thousand years. So on the one hand, I affirm this element of what premillennialism traditionally has affirmed a, a coming future literal kingdom, however you want to say that, and that amillennialists just don't seem to like. Again, they, they they're preferring the kingdom being now, totally period, and then we go off into heaven, whatever that is, but. I, I think I think the the biblical idea of heaven is actually the new earth. So you know if if that fits in somebody's system, that's nice. If it doesn't fit into somebody's system, that's okay too. I don't I don't worry about how I'm sort of tiptoeing through systems too much. All right, Brian has a pair of questions, and the first one is: Doctor Heiser has been on the Trinities podcast in the past with Dale Tuggy. Mm-hmm. Dale is a Christian. Unitarian, and I don't think Dr. Heiser interprets scripture this way, but I could be wrong. Can Dr. Heiser? Uh, correct. I am not a Unitarian. That was easy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Second one is I wonder if Dr. Heiser would have any guidance on the scholar George Hawkins. A friend of mine bought his Pimper collection, and I wondered about the quality of his work. Yeah, I've, I, I can't really comment on him because I've not heard of him. So that was easy too. We need more questions. Oh, yeah. Brian. Just, well, can you, can you talk about the Pember? Um, well, I, you know, I, I don't know a whole lot about Pember as well. I know we have this sort of old earth, you know, creationist, you know, model. I, I, I'm not sure if Pember was Pember a gap theorist. I can't, I can't recall specifically if Pember uh, adopted the gap theory or not. I mean, if, if he did, then, you know, a lot of listeners are going to know that I'm not, uh, positively predisposed to the gap theory, but uh, yeah, I have you know, his book Earliest Earth, and I can't remember. Yeah, I I, I kind of think he is, but I don't want to I don't want to tag him with that without actually going back to look it up. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's probably all I can 
all I can contribute to yeah, that early, question. Earliest ages. I, I need to go back and read that one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just not sure you know, right. what, where he's at. All right. The next one is from Jad in Melbourne, Australia. And I apologize if I butchered your name, Jad. Here is his question. And this is an important one. Mm-hmm. How should I approach talking to members of my church about much of the subject matter that is discussed in your work? I'm frequently told by my older brothers and sisters in Christ, whenever I hint at some of these topics, that I shouldn't bring up subjects that could cause the faith of others to be lost or weakened. Who should I go to to talk about these things with at all? So I, I, I'm a little, I'm, again, I'm, I'm being... I'm being a little sarcastic here, but I'm also being, you know, there's there's an element of sincerity here too. I don't know how it would harm the faith of other people to know their Bible better. Now, if if you're talking about things like talking about, um, you know, the Book of Enoch or something like that, then I can see that a little bit more, you know, because that's a that's an external source to Scripture. But for the life of me, I really don't understand how you know, walking up to someone and saying, hey, you know, let, let, let's let devote ourselves for a month to studying Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and, and you know, seeing if, if, if the sons of God, the Nephilim, you know, were like just normal people or, or, or something beyond that, you know, like, how does that harm someone's faith? Faith in what? I mean, if you're linking the gospel to stuff like this, you've got bigger problems than Mike's book, you know, I mean, it, it, then you don't understand the gospel, period. You know, if, if he means, you know, harming the faith of someone to being something like making people have questions about Bible passages, well, that's sort of a byproduct of having a pulse. I mean, to be honest with you, if, you, if you're a thinking adult and if you're devoting yourself to reading Scripture, I don't know how you could read Scripture and not have questions pop into your head. Because the alternative to that, if, if questions never pop into your head, then it's like saying, well, everything in the Bible that I'm reading here is self-evident. There are no questions. I understand everything completely and perfectly. And I, I, I just don't know, how, I don't know how anyone uh, who would be a sincere reader of Scripture could ever think that. So I, I, don't, I don't really quite know how to, to approach the question other than kind of throwing out those random thoughts. But look, if... if you know, I, I guess on a bad day, if if I were at this person's church or small group and got this question, um, I would say, look, if you really believe this thing that's sitting on your lap is the Word of God, why wouldn't you want to know all that you possibly could about it? And if you have questions, and you're bound to have questions because the Bible, it just transcends a surface self-evident reading. I've never met anybody who reads the Bible that didn't have a question about it. So how does wanting to get an answer to a question, how is that a questionable enterprise? If you really believe this is the word of God, I, I don't understand any the approach of anyone who would believe that and then, and then would turn around and say, well, good grief, I don't, I don't want to know too much about it. You know, if, if I have questions, I don't really want to probe it too much. I don't really want answers to these questions because that make me that might make might generate other questions. And I don't want to I don't really want to know too much about the word of God, do I? I just don't get it. I don't get the whole the whole approach, the whole premise, the whole mindset. And again, I, I know I under I, I feel for the the questioner, you know, the this struggle, because I, you know, I still get this. I mean, I I'm not you know, sort of like living off in my own, well, maybe, maybe I am, I'm living off in my cult commune here and I never come into contact with real people here that, uh, that have the, these sorts of questions. Of course, that's just absurd. I mean, I, I still do get these kinds of questions and I, and I can read on people's faces, you know, that I interact with that they're, you know, they're a little disturbed. But when, and when you ask them the question, you know, they're, they're going to, well, of course I want to know about the Bible. And then the, my follow-up question is, well, then what's the problem you know th- this is this is part of of growing as a christian this is part of of hungering for truth god bothered to give you truth and why you would want to sort of turn the spigot off at some point i don't understand and and you know it really comes down i think to sort of comfort level kinds of things with people 
they like the feeling that that they have everything kind of nailed down. You know, they 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 like the feeling that their pastor has sort of got everything under his belt, and if it's important, the pastor will tell me about it. But I again, I don't I don't see how that really honors the the idea that God has given given us this thing we call the Word of God. We are commanded to study it. You know, to show ourselves approved, you know, all the all the, the verses that we know. And yet somehow our process of doing that is having it dispensed to us through an authority figure. I, I, I just literally, I have difficulty comprehending uh, even the whole approach, the whole uh, hesitation, but I know it's real. All right, our next one's from Andrew, and he writes, I often hear preachers say in salvation context that we must contact the blood of Christ and baptism. I can find no such passage that claims we must contact it or that it is even contactable. If we follow the allusions to many of the sacrifices and offerings in Leviticus, it doesn't even appear that the blood and the worshiper ever contact each other. The only reference I can find where man and blood are connected is in Exodus 24. Do we contact Christ's blood and baptism as is suggested in from pulpits, or are they selling snake oil? Yeah, this one's easy too. They're selling snake oil. Um, I, I have never actually heard this idea: you know, c- contacting the blood of Christ through baptism. Very strange. Uh, f- very strange. I mean, that, I mean, and the questioner says, "Hey, I, I can't find a, a single verse for this." Well, that ought to tell you something. Uh, I, I would assert again to to the, the the questioner and to the people selling him the snake oil that if we can't find our theology in the biblical text, by definition, it isn't biblical theology. So again, that that's just sort of an axiomatic thing. Uh, to be able to call your theology biblical, you ought, actually ought to be able to find it in there somewhere. So, you know that that would be my answer to that. But it's just a that's a very very strange. Um, idea. I'm, I'm, it has me wondering if it's sort of like code language for some other idea that might be more familiar. Um, but you know, I don't. I don't want to read into the question. Okay. Our last question is from Jay in Midland, Texas. If you were granted an audience with Paul the Apostle after the resurrection, and you could only ask him one or two questions, what would you ask him? It just has me wondering if after the resurrection means like when Paul was alive post resurrection or after the like when we all get to heaven or is there any indication in his question that, that there's a distinction there? No. All right. Well, let me. I, I guess it'll be. I'll, I'll assume that it's. Hey, when I'm in heaven and I get to see Paul or something like that. Um, what would I ask Paul? Boy, I I, I thought I had it. Something just popped into my head, but now the question doesn't make any sense. I, mean, I thought a good question would be, hey, what are you doing up there? But if I'm there, then I already know that. <laughs> so, well, I, you know, if, if if the point of the question is when I get to be there with Paul, I, wouldn't, I really wouldn't have any questions. What else could he mean? <laughs> I mean, help me out here, Trey. What else? Maybe when he was still alive. Read the question Earth. again. I just I if don't you get were it. granted an audience with Paul the Apostle after the resurrection. Okay. So let's just say here on Earth. Resurrection. All right. So I'm living back when Paul's there. So mm-hmm. Paul's not in the resurrected body. Paul is Paul. And I and we're living after the resurrection of Christ. So that's how we're reading it now? Is yeah, that does that sound that. right? Let's, let's okay. go with that, yeah. All right. So if I went back in time and I talked to Paul post resurrection what would i ask him boy <laughs> yeah i've i've never actually even thought you know i i feel like i'm in a star trek episode where i could be captain janeway and say i swore at the academy i would never do that time travel thing um i don't know if how many people in our audience are trekkies but that's you know i've never really thought about this time travel thing uh, what would i ask paul oh boy um Wow. <laughs> the, short, the short answer is I don't know. Um, yeah, so you thought this was a good question to end with, Trey. But I, I did. I, 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 just, for... I have no idea what I'd ask him. Um, I, you know, I, I might ask him if he, if he really – because I, I, this is something I suspect. 
I suspect that Paul believed that he wouldn't die until he reached Spain. So I, I might actually ask him that. Um, it, but again, that presumes he's he's had his call to be the apostle of the Gentiles and sort of has that that kind of rooted, you know, in in his heart, in his mind. But if you know, if, if I knew that, and he was like on his missionary journey somewhere, I would that that would probably be something I'd ask him, you know, about the whole. Uh, getting to Tarshish thing, you know, is, is this how you define completion? You know, and, and while we're getting into his epistles, I might ask him something like, hey, do you think that there is a future for national, you know, ethnic Israel? Or is the Israel of God now only the church? Because that, that's a key eschatological question that I don't think Paul uh, is, is clear on, you know, in his epistles. So I might ask him for clarification of of that particular issue. Uh, it's just such a thorny one. And uh, you know, now that I've said the word thorn, another thing pops into my head. Was, was the, you know, was the uh, the messenger of Satan, you know, sent to buffet him that he writes about? Was that a was that a supernatural opposer? In other words, was he uh, was he being oppressed, you know, by entities, or was it just sort of an expression? You know, that refers to some physical malady, something like that. So, so there, there's a few. Those are those are things I'd want to know. But again, you know, depending on, hey, are you a Christian yet or not? That that might be the first one, you know, out of my mouth if we just ran into each other, you know, in some place, and I knew it was Paul. I'd want to know that first. I'd probably ask him if he prefers Saul or Paul. <laughs> Yeah, or what, what did what did yeah? What was the argument about? You know, when when you had to you know split up there and you're you, over John Mark. You know, what was that all about? Well, all right, Mike. Well, that's all the questions we got for this one. So um, we appreciate it. And can you give us an update about your companion books that we can't get? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for putting it that way. <laughs> well, hopefully by the time that this uh, this airs, people will be able to get those books. I mean. The the problem is that Amazon. Let me just back up a little bit. I had announced in the blog that hey, you know the the question answer companion by Doug Van Dorn, you know, for Unseen Realm is now available on Amazon, and Ron Johnson's Leader Guide is available for Supernatural. Then somebody emailed me literally the next day and said, hey, you know, I went up and looked, and Amazon already says copies available in one to three weeks. You know, what's up with that? And in view of the of the struggle, you know, to get Unseen Realm launched that we had with Amazon, I just thought, oh, great, you know, here we go again. But I so I asked in the building, and they said basically the problem was that Amazon hadn't received the shipment yet from the printer, and so hopefully by by the time of this podcast, that is no longer an issue. If it is, I got nothing else for you. I don't know what the problem is, but that's what I was told. So hopefully that you know will be taken care of. Sounds good. And Mike, next week we have another interview. Yep. Yeah, we do. This one, I, I'm, I mean, I, I always look forward to them when we schedule them and, and they all have a purpose. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get people, you know, involved in the podcast that I view as having some role in divine counsel content or what we're trying to do, uh, both now and, 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 you know, ultimately down the road with the nonprofit with McLot. And our next guest is going to be Tim Andrews, who was the guy who under you know undertook you know the the task of organizing the Unseen Realm event in Atlanta last November. Now I didn't know it at the time, but I I discovered it pretty quickly uh, when I got to Atlanta that Tim is involved with a pretty large uh, house church network, for for lack of a better way to describe it. And that he's been doing that kind of thing for 20 years or more. And we, we just had some really interesting conversations because my only conception of house church, I've never been in a house church, was, you know, we're a group of people meeting here. We don't like the pastor and there's no other church in town. So we still want to do church stuff. So here we are, you know, so kind of a dumb, simplistic sort of thing floating around in my head because the people I've met, you know, that are part of these things are, are often there because they're disgruntled by something else. But but that did not seem to be the case at all. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Tim would say they get some of that. But I mean, to have this, to have this, this effort, this thing be so enduring and, and actually growing. And again, just some of the other things I heard about it, the, the, the way they conduct themselves, 
uh, and, and what they do and sort of what their their goals are in, in, in why they do what they do. It really made me think about the whole, um, you know, again, for people who've, who've read The Portent, which is where the term McLot comes from, there is this, you know, this sense of, of, of believers who, for whatever set of circumstances, are just, have just taken it upon themselves to do what needs to be done. And they're not waiting for, again, an authority figure to give them permission to do it. And, and I've, I've brought this, this up on, on other podcasts. You know, what if church was not a time or a place? You know, what if, what if the things we associate with church were no longer a reality, no longer available to us, like buildings? You know, if we, if we, what if we were monitored by the state? You know, what if churches lose tax-exempt status? You know, what if, you know, URLs are taken away from Christian organizations and you can't promote yourself on social media or you're, you know, you've got the, the overlords with hate speech crimes, you know, you know, monitoring what, what you say and do. I mean, what, what, what if it had to be something different for, you know, again, some, some specific set of circumstances? How would, how would we function? And Tim is a guy who has thought a lot about that and has actually tried to experiment and put things into practice and sort of just see how it goes. And they, you know, he, he was just telling me they've learned an awful lot uh, about doing things this way, uh, both good and bad, things they would do again, things they wouldn't do again. And I thought it would be a really interesting discussion to bring to the podcast because of, again, this is one of the things that McLaught is about, uh, networking believers you know, finding out who who has experience doing this or that that, that we might you know find valuable down the road, uh, who is who has a particular skill set to help you know believers out in some other part of the country. And Tim is really into the Divine Council content. He said it has really helped what they do in terms of their content uh, teaching you know in in this network a lot, which is why he wanted to organize the event. So I think it'll be a really interesting discussion just because of those elements, you know, that those, that this is what he, he sort of can bring to the table. And we just want to pick his brain a little bit, you know, and do it in a podcast episode. And, and I think he'll help us think about these things better. All right. Well, looking forward to that. All right, Mike, is there anything else you'd like to add to the show? No, I think that's it. Okay. Well, we, we appreciate you answering our questions and just want to thank you all for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless you. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.